Anybody here been a part of that? Well, I've already mentioned before. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so the, if you were to apply this principle, the first thing would be you would come into a meeting, you would observe. The very first thing you would do, you would listen, you would watch. Oh, Heron's saying that. Oh, I see that Jeff likes that. I see that. Okay, and then you can contribute. You, you wouldn't just come in and blah, 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 blah. So observe, then interact. Number two, catch and store energy. Um, to gather and hold energy that nature has provided vis-a-vis, -vis, and then and then you can do this in a many 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 different ways. I'm gonna I'm gonna talk on it on the physical level first, and then we'll move into like a sociocracy. So, if you, for example, are working with a piece of land, you would create natural ponds to store water, which then can be used for multiple process uh, uh, applications. Um, you could save and protect topsoil. So it doesn't get eroded away. So you can continuously grow crops. You can you can build the topsoil. In fact, you could leave the soil in in a better condition than when you started. If you were being aware and you were um, you were you were uh, planning that into the design to begin with, um, you might protect a forest until they're mature. For example, one of the one of the uh, aspects of ecoforestry is based the modern ecoforestry movement is based on permaculture, and that is simply this this ethic is that when you walk into a forest and you want to harvest some of it, you don't harvest more than what it provides in a year. In other words, if I'm gonna if I'm looking at a one acre plot of of of, of trees, I would not take more board feet than naturally grow, grows in one season. That way I'm not harming that, that, that acre of forest. Of course, that's not how it's done these days. I mean, we go and clear cut three square miles and don't care if it ever comes back. And this is gonna, this is gonna come around and bite us. The way we treat nature is, going, is already doing that. You're gonna see this accelerate. A climate change, there's a lot of natural problems besides all the human ones we're dealing with. There's a lot of natural problems that are gonna be coming down in the next few years uh, from our children. Our children are gonna face some pretty severe natural problems. And it's because of the, of the industrial revolution, the last 200 years of plunder and pleasure without consciousness. Uh, so it's important to catch and store energy. You can do that with, we can catch a, a wind with a windmill. We can turn that into electricity without destroying the planet. We could take uh, sun rays and turn that into hot water to take showers with and wash your dishes with. So there's a lot of things we can, we can use. Nature's always providing. But if we're not paying attention, we can't learn how to accept what's already being provided and make us more abundant and more healthy. Number three, obtain a yield. Obtain a yield. This means to sustainably extract a harvest of some kind. Um, and you could, you, we could then apply that in associate Sociocracy. It's a hard one to say. Yes, it is. Sociocratic. Oh, no. Sociocratic. Sociocratic. Oh, I think I add a few more syllables onto that one. The sociocratic uh, uh, um, application, you could say, in this environment, in this meeting right here, we hope to we hope to um, dispel some knowledge. That would be a harvest, right? Maybe something of me comes out, and you walk away with something of that. So that would be to me would be a harvest. We're taking some knowledge, spreading it, and maybe it'll go beyond this room as we move forward in our lives. Maybe some of these principles will then be studied and used later on. So, um, and then we could obviously use that in a simple way, you know, uh, plant blueberries and take and get blueberries in the summer, you know, and you can take this as a simple. But always obtain a yield within your design. Make your design produce, but in a sustainable way. And make it produce constantly. It should, it should always be giving back. If it's a good design, it should function. Meaning that it should meet, it should meet people's needs, it should meet uh, the ecosystem's needs, and it should do it in a fair and balanced way. Uh, the Haudenosaunee, who are the indigenous people of this area, this bioregion, for a very long time, um, have a saying, a lot of times they have a saying, uh, and I don't know it in their tongue, I just know it in the English, and uh, it means, uh, um, a lot of times the prayer is, they'll say something that they want, or say something that they're being thankful for, and then, or for a ceremony they're about to do, and they'll say, may this be accomplished, or may this be blessed, in a good and balanced way. You hear that a lot. I hear that a lot on the res in a good and balanced way. So that's what we need to be striving for: balance within our design. So number four: apply self-regulation and accept feedback. 
self-evaluate your interactions with each other in nature, and whatever permaculture design system you are using, be open to new information or criticism, and if you find an error in your judgment, in your design, in your action, or in your thinking, adjust your position accordingly. You could also just name this uh, emergent, the emergent. Uh, the emergent aspect of reality is that it's, your design is always dynamic, always evolving, always evolving. And in that dynamism, you're going to find out that new information arises from the old. And this new information can inform your current actions and your future actions if you're open. If you're open. Of course, if you're not open, um, then you just keep doing what you keep doing. And what is, can someone tell me what the definition of insanity is? Doing the same thing over and over again with a different, expecting exactly. a different result. Exactly. So um, apply self-regulation and accept feedback from your design and from each other. Number five, use and value and value renewable, uh, renewable resources and services. Uh, how this is explained is use what is replaceable and readily available within nature or human systems. Set limits to consumption. Apply renewable energy systems into the design. Um, and, reply, and apply uh, techniques such as, um, not just, no, we're not just talking about renewables, right? We could also say instead of going buying new clothing for a status, right? Instead of going to the mall and getting like the hottest thing, why not go to the thrift store and find something that is workable, good, decent, but it's not, we're not, we're not demanding that a new product be developed and new energy uh, stores be used. We're going to use what's already there. It's still usable. It's an item that's still usable. Someone passed it on, and it may be a lot cheaper. We have to work less for it, so again, less energy has to go into it. So use what is readily available first. It doesn't say you can't you know, get something new. It says when you're maximizing a design, use what is read readily available. Um, one of the reasons uh, my whole life I wanted to build a cob home in nature. One of the reasons I want to do that is because I want to walk onto a piece of property, a piece of woods, piece of land and I want to use what's there to build a house. I don't want to import anything. I want to use the rocks that are there, the trees that are there, the soil that's there, the sand, the mud, the clay and build a house because it can be done. And, and in fact it can be done, these are some of the longest lasting houses on earth or crop houses, but that's it for another time. Um, so use and value renewable resources and services. Number six, produce no waste. Again, this is from the study of nature. Nature doesn't have waste at all, zero. So we have a lot to learn from nature. We need to pay more, to more attention to it. Nature doesn't produce waste. It simply moves energy into matter and matter into it. It just keeps exchanging it in a very efficient way, very efficient way. Use and value, uh, and this is, and I'll explain a little bit. Use and value recyclable materials such as clothing, building materials, and furniture. Learn how to reduce, reuse, recycle, repair. Centralize these values within the design. Focus on reducing consumption with an effort to reuse and repair items, uh, as these are often underutilized strategies. Number seven, design from patterns to details. So, when you walk into a, when you're designing a a settlement, a camp, uh, you, look, you observe the area where you're about to put your tents or, or uh, build your house or what is it, whatever you're going to do. Um, have your meeting and you want to look at the patterns that are already there and you want to go out from that into detail. So start with the patterns that you're noticing first and then you move into detail. Observe natural patterns in nature such as spirals, cloud forms, waves, branching, and use these patterns in your design to efficiently produce and store energy and obtain yields. This is the reason why um, scientists are now using biomimicry and technology, because they have not found better ways of moving energy. They haven't found it. Uh, branching on a leaf, uh, branching on a tree, or the veins in a leaf, or the root systems of a tree. These are the most efficient ways to move uh, um, food and nourishment from one source up to another source. It's the most efficient way. So we should mimic that and use that in our designs as much as possible. Uh, if you see that there's a book, where's the book right now? Uh, if you open up to the page, okay, see where, the middle, see where the, the okay, so mark? It's stuck in the middle, okay. If you, right where it's marked, you open oh, up right to the page. You see, the, you see this mandala design? 
one dot. Hold, yeah, hold that up. So this design was discovered um, from really generations of, of farming, generations. This design um, creates an enormous amount of yield from a small area because of the edge. I'll get into that very shortly. Um, but I just want to, and you can keep that moving around. You can look through that book. Okay, sorry. Oh, it's fine. Um, okay, uh, we'll move on to number eight. Integrate rather than segregate. Again, another principle we could easily use and are using to some extent in the occupation movement. Use inclusiveness as the basis for strength and abundance through biodiversity. From form plant guilds and design for maximum mutually beneficial relationships. Um, so this is this is more talking about um, planting and that type of thing. But but again, you can use the same principle in our movement itself. Integrate, be inclusive, bring as many people in together as you can, and try to find a home for their gifts, for their voice, for their talents, for their strengths, and try to use our strengths to uplift their weaknesses. So we all have weaknesses, we all have strengths, and in, in a good design. You would be able to use your strength to edify my weakness, and I'd be able to use my strength to edify your weakness, and then we would have a pretty strong community. Number nine, use small and slow solutions. This is a very important one. These are all important, but uh, over time, permaculture designers have been doing this 20, 30 years. I found that number nine continues to be very foundational to design. Use small and slow solutions. Again, this is something we don't do in the West. Capitalism doesn't do this. We're always looking for the big box sell. We're always looking to go big, go big or go home. You know, you know, play with the big dogs or go home. You know, so every, everything is big, 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 big. What you find, what we find, in, when you design something, is that when you go big at first, if you didn't get it right, you've just created the potential for a really big problem. So. This, this idea, and I'll, and I'll read it, is try to overcome the temptation to consolidate or overbuild and instead take a long-term, small or micro approach to a model. So if you think that um, something is going to work and you want to put in design, start off with say half or a quarter of the size that you think you're going to eventually want to be at. Just try the model out. Just kick the tires. If it works, you can always level up. You can always create a bigger system. If it doesn't work, you then are, haven't invested in this large-term approach. So use small and slow, slow solutions. Don't go fast. Take your time. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. Number 10, use and value diversity. Again, uh, very similar to integrate rather than segregate, but it, it has its own value. Avoid uh, monopolies or monocropping or having only one major source of harvest. Produce a multiplicity of energy. Um, people or food systems, uh, you want to increase diversity in your plant. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. You want to you have different means of producing. Number 11, and here's where that uh, mandala comes in, is use the edges and value the margin. Value the intersection of different systems at the place where they meet and integrate this value into the design. This is known as the edge. It is where the highest yields and most energy are found. And this is a fact. The places, what is it? Does anybody know where the majority of human beings live? What, 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 um, here, let me water. ask the question. What are you going to say? Near water. Exactly. Yeah. Why? Why is it? We, we need water. We, we need water, but you can find water all kinds of places. So, what, give me another reason. Why do you think the majority of the cities, the largest populations of human beings, live on coasts? Why is that? Other ideas? Convenience. Transportation. Sure, getting in a boat, going somewhere, sure. Trolley. Some, some say we came from the sea originally. Sure. Talk biology, but the fact that we're made up of the majority of water. Sure. One of the major reasons, though, that we're missing here is because the edge where land masses meet water, that coast, that shore, happens to have the most abundant forms and diversity of food and life and potential growing climates. So you have trees, usually, maybe mountains. You have, you have kind of like forest or land bases meeting a water base, where there's fish, where there is sand, where there's building materials, where there's rocks, where there's open space, where there's closed space. In other words, everything you need is, a, is right there at that edge where two or more systems meet. That's why the mandala was found to be so successful in producing 
uh, so much energy and so and so many crops is because wherever there's an edge, wherever the edge of many systems meet, and the more systems, the better. So say you have a forest meeting an ocean. There's two edges, right? That's good. That's that's where you want to be, right near that edge, because you're going to be able to find all kinds of things you need there. But what if we have a desert that meets a forest that meets an ocean that meets a grassland. What if four systems interact right in one area? Right? So the more places you can find that interact, again, then this goes back to diversity. So the more people we can bring into this movement, the more interaction we can get, the stronger and the more abundance we're going to get. Of course, there's always the problem of chaos. <laughs> but we'll figure this that kind out. Of goes That's human nature. Chaos. Chaos. Being this grand crossroads exactly. between the continents. No, absolutely. Perfect point. If you look at the Mediterranean, which is sometimes desert, water, forests, mountains, mountains, all there. Absolutely. It's no, it's no accident that that's considered the cradle of civilization. It's no accident. It's where art and language flourished, where the first um, cities started. It's not an accident. Um,